维沃的。We are now live. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we are going into live a little bit earlier than usual because we want to ah、uh, wait for more people to join us. So we're going to just do some chit chatting for five minutes. <laughs> Yes. So it's us again. This is Kaishan、uh, and Amanda from、uh, the organizer for Booing Tea Festival.、Uh, we are a virtual tea festival based in Australia, and we target.、Um, you know, we basically separate or、uh, celebrate pure leaf tea. So tea that doesn't have any additive, any、um, you know sweetener. No chemicals and also no blends, and that's what we are for. And we also、uh, celebrate art of brewing. And、um, yeah, so、um, we will be,、um, you know, going to the meat of the live show、uh, in three minutes, and just waiting for some more people to jump in.、Uh, how are you going, Amanda, today? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you brewing something today, Kaishan? Ah,、uh, yes, actually, I am. Um, because I had a little chat with Tanya. Tanya will be featured in episode four about Taiwanese tea, and I just received her um tea sample, and ah,、uh, she sent me a Hongyun. So ah,、uh, this is a Taiwanese black tea. And we actually talked a little bit last night about the history of、uh, tea in Taiwan. And there was a period of time that you know they were trying to、uh, grow a lot of black tea、uh, in Taiwan.、Um, yeah, so that was very interesting to dive into. And this is the tea that I quite like. I feel like that、um, Hong Hong Yun and the in and the ruby is like、um, just. A very very different black tea comparing to Yunnan, comparing to Lapsang, because ah、uh, it's just nice and light and sweet. I think I said to Tanya last night that I feel like this is almost like the soft drink in um black tea, because it's so palatable and I think that even little kids will love um you know um this tea. It sort of have a lychee fragrance to me, very fruity. Yeah, and this is what I'm drinking at the moment. <laughs> what What about you? What are you gonna drink later? You You muted You muted yourself. Let me unmute you. Sorry,、yeah. I had a lot of noise in the background. Um, I have a、uh, a little disc of a、uh, compressed white tea、uh, by Muda.、Mm. Oh, okay. Very well. Please. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So I can't remember exactly how old it is, <laughs> but I, I think it's at least three or four years old. So we're、yeah. going to bring that up, and I think it's a nice day for that. It should be nice and warm and and flowing. Yeah. Well, ah,、uh, personal experience. Ah,、uh, white tea is really good to be to have in. Melbourne, I mean, ah,、uh, because um, Melbourne's not good for aging poor, but aging white tea is actually a good place for it. So you know, doesn't matter how old it is, the older the better. Because I we have a saying, say, ah,、uh, one year is tea, three years is medicine, and then seven year is treasure or something like that. I'll look up the exact saying and share it later. Yeah, but ah.、Uh, yeah. I am right. Oh,、okay. my back is improving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, you know, it's great to like bowl by your white tea because it's cheaper, and then just forget it for three years, and then drink it later. Like you know, um, but I wouldn't recommend to do that with a、uh, poor, you know, poor. I only do small quantity. Because I think、yeah. with white tea too, it's only a fairly new thing that they started aging it, isn't it? Um. Yes and no. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there are like a lot of theories around, you know, if uh, Agent YT is a recent thing, it's definitely uh, very, very trendy, you know, uh, commercially. But I do think that, you know, uh, you know, people had been doing it, you know, on their own. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, now now we have six viewers. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so we will jump into what, you know, uh, we are planning to do with this live. So uh, again, you know, uh, Brewing Tea Festival is created to support the local, um, the Australian tea community for Pulitzer Tea. And uh, we are making it more like a TV show. So um, there are now a total of 12 episodes, including the one that we aired last Thursday. This is episode two. And then the following episodes, each one will feature a different tea professional. And we will talk about in-depth tea questions, like including history, culture, brewing technique, and all that. And all the teas that we feature in the show uh, is either already available in our marketplace on Facebook or will be available in the marketplace um, on Facebook. And Amanda, if you can play a little bit intro video for our Brewing TV. And then we will back. We will be back in thirty seconds. I can do that. And four hundred and fifty mil. So yes, that is the TV program that we're creating. And uh, if you have any feedbacks or any, um, you know, content that you specifically are interested about and want us to cover, please leave us a comment because, um, you know, um, that is the beauty of having a live event that we can constantly tweet our content and then we want to make it, you know, um, the, the way that you would like it so we got a lot of interaction and then yeah so leave a comment if there's a topic that you would like us to cover and we are we will do our best to address it now today uh we are watching a documentary together um it's about chinese tea um so we will play, because it's a one hour long uh, documentary, so we will play it um, halfway. If you have any questions, again, uh, leave a comment, and then we will pick some interesting topic that we can discuss in a Q&A. And, um, and then after we discuss it, then we will play the rest of the documentary because, you know, it will go over one hour because we pick a long documentary sorry guys um so if that sounds good give us a thumbs up <laughs> and then we will start playing the video unless you have any questions now then we will answer it in the chat for you but we will shut up for for now <laughs> let's play the documentary thank you amanda <laughs> After water, it is the most popular beverage in the world. Older than the Chinese ancients who first lauded its properties, its history spans nearly five millennia. It is no ordinary thing, no simple liquid, but a powerful brew infused with the meditative Chinese spirit. What was born of China will remain China's signature drink. 
It is Chinese tea, elixir of the Orient. On any given day in homes, offices, and shops across the United States, over half of the population drinks tea. 158 million of us enjoy this seemingly commonplace beverage while bustling about town. Although our country is the second largest importer of tea behind Russia, we know very little about the trademark wisdom and countless values of this historic drink. Most of us have never given a fleeting thought to how the tea that fills our cup was made. We don't consider its origin, how or why it became so popular. Yet in the history and culture of tea, powerful truths await us. To discover them, we must dig back to the root, to China, where the first dried leaves touched hot water. There, we'll uncover something far deeper and more complex than we'd ever imagined in this elixir of the Orient. Strip away our modern-day, Western notions of tea drinking. Trace the story of tea back to its inception, to the discovery of the tea leaf. Where do we find ourselves? Alongside legendary Chinese emperor and herbalist Shen Nong, in the biggest windfall moment in ancient Chinese history. Shen Nong is a very interesting figure. As the legend goes, he was the leader of a tribe four or five thousand years ago. He had a bull's head with two horns. There are many tea-related stories about him. One is about his transparent belly through which you could see his intestines. So he ate a lot of tea to cleanse the inside of his belly. That's why the plant is called tea, because tea has a similar pronunciation as the character white in Chinese. Another story tells that our ancestors lived under a big tree, and sometimes they boiled water in a pot outdoors. One day, they noticed that suddenly the water in the pot was very fragrant. Then they discovered leaves were floating on the water's surface. They had fallen from the tree above, and the resulting mix tasted very good. After drinking it, people were in good spirits. Whether by human accident or divine fate, emperor, scholar, and herbalist Shen Nong's discovery unexpectedly ushered tea onto the scene. By the second century, tea's utility in Chinese culture was decidedly medicinal. Its powerful, curative abilities were tantamount to divine healing. Tea became integrally rooted in the country's main religions, known collectively as the Three Teachings, Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Since its inception, tea has been different from other drinks. It has a material value, spiritual value, and cultural value. As early as the Xia, Shang, and Zhou dynasties, especially the Zhou dynasty, tea was used to consecrate the temple and thought of as being infused with spiritual meaning. Buddhism ascribed to tea a Zen quality. Tea kept monks awake while meditating. It calmed the stomach. Tea's popularity rose so sharply, even Taoists vaunted its benefits, labeling this leaf a key ingredient in the elixir of immortality. Coincidentally, the misty mountainsides, home to Buddhist and Taoist temples, symbolically removed from the mundane world, also grew the best tea plants. 
According to Taoism, tea is a panacea. Tea was believed to be one of the medicines that might help human beings defy mortality and become celestial beings. In the Tang Dynasty, there was a famous poet who was also a well-known tea master, whose name was Lu Tan. He wrote a very popular lyrical poem called Seven Bowls of Tea, describing how he drank seven bowls of tea consecutively, noting how his state of mind was enhanced after each bowl. The first bowl quenched his thirst. After the second bowl, he was no longer lonely. After the third, he felt much more enlightened and could write more easily. When he drank the fourth bowl, he began perspiring and felt all unpleasant sensations leave his body. After the fifth bowl, he felt lighter. After the sixth, he thought he could communicate with the gods of both earth and sky. He said he dared not to drink the seventh bowl, fearing he might grow wings and fly away, the soft wind lifting him to the skies, becoming a celestial being. The ancient Chinese praised almighty tea for its incomparable ability to aid digestion, banish sleepiness, restore vitality, and uplift the spirit. The ultimate ideal of Taoism is a state of harmony with the soul. This transcendence of the body can be a lifelong endeavor. Among many foods reputed to bring long life, tea is the first choice of the Chinese. We consider 108 the ideal age life should last. So how to live so long? Tea is the key. In 8th century China, during the Tang Dynasty, tea transcended its role as a purely medicinal drink. It became what we recognize today, a beverage drunk for pleasure. This pivotal change is attributed to one man, Lu Yu, China's sage of tea. Lu Yu was a great figure of the mid-Tang dynasty. He'd been discarded as a foundling, so didn't receive a good education at school. Instead, he taught himself and developed his talents. In his 20s, he left northern China to come to Hangzhou. The classic of tea is the first book about tea, and at the same time, is the first monograph about tea culture in the history of the world. The book is divided into three volumes. Its 10 chapters cover the origins of tea, how it is grown, what water to use, and all aspects of drinking it. Liu Yu was doing pioneering work with no one before or after him writing about tea in the same way. It's one of the great works of the world. Liu Yu insists on the importance of ritual during tea preparation seeing tea practice as another activity to celebrate life. The best tea must pass through nine stages of manufacture, seven stages of brewing, and is handled with a special set of 24 implements. It's very interesting. In the classic of tea, there are several chapters involving water. The standard then ranked the mountain water as the best, followed by river water, and finally, well water. Among all waters, mountain springs were the highest quality. Even today, the Chinese people adhere to Lu Yu's prescribed principles. The popular expression, water is the mother of tea, captures the importance of selecting a pure water source. Of the available options for natural water, Tiger Running Spring in the city of Hangzhou is considered supreme. After Lu Yu, tea would never again be some lowly thing. Producing, brewing, drinking, and enjoying tea would forever be a ritualistic form of art. Making a superior cup of tea involves four elements. First, the tea itself must be good. Second, the utensils must be appropriate for that particular tea. Third, there are techniques to heating the water and steeping the tea that guarantee the best flavor. For example, heating the water too slowly will take away some of its fragrance and freshness. Fourth, and the most important one, the water needs to be of the best quality. All of these complex factors are learned with experience, and the Chinese admire those who have mastered what it takes to get it right. That is why we call it 
tea art, for there is indeed an art to producing a superior cup of tea. This very art behind superior tea gave Chinese culture the staying power to endure, even defy, the effects of Western expansionism. Before tea became popular, there had been large-scale plagues. But during the Tang Dynasty, when tea consumption became widespread, plagues such as the European Black Death didn't occur here. We attribute this to our habit of drinking tea. We know after the Ming and Qing dynasties, China's tea spread across the world, first to Turkey, Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Now, 61 countries around the world grow tea, and people from more than 100 countries drink it. In this way, tea truly became a global cultural phenomenon. With centuries of history, countless virtues, and deep spiritual meanings, tea has permanently captivated China. This magical herb is now irrevocably part and parcel of the Chinese identity. A Ming Dynasty writer once said, All of my life I have had little desire for material goods and made few demands for much of anything. All I want is a cup of tea in the mountains, and that will be enough. If we had to symbolize the Chinese nation with a plant, then there's nothing more appropriate than tea. It's poetic, romantic, authentic, and the more you pluck it, the more vigorous it becomes. But it's also reserved. These qualities of tea resemble the spiritual core of our Chinese nation. I can suggest to Westerners a simple route to understanding China. Seek to understand tea. In the plant kingdom, Chinese tea is classified Camellia sinensis. It grows along hillsides in geometric patterns, as picturesque as illustrations from a storybook. The growth of tea trees is dependent on two factors, climate and soil. From the composition variables of these two conditions, we can conclude that tea trees prefer a warm and wet climate. Some tea trees grow on hills as they require a high level of permeability between soil and water, and that is more easily found when they are planted on slopes. According to the latest statistics, 18 provinces in China produce tea. Most of these regions are located south of the Yangtze River. China produces more than one-third of the world's tea. Whether plucked from a small tea bush pruned regularly for ease of picking, or a towering centuries-old tree, Camellia sinensis can produce six common tea varieties. Green, white, yellow, dark, red, known in the West as black tea, and oolong. Although they all come from the same plant, different manufacturing processes create markedly different results. These perfectly processed leaves are infused in boiled water to release their essence. It's quite easy to distinguish different kinds of tea if they are put in front of you. Green tea should be fragrant, and the infusion should also be green, as one might imagine. On the color scale, white and yellow tea are lighter than green tea, coming in various shades of yellow. Oolong tea tends to be the lightest. Pu'er, particularly the ripest pu'er, is a very deep brown red color, while red tea is slightly lighter and more reddish, of course. The color of these six tea categories is closely related to the manufacturing process each undergoes. Specifically, the more they ferment, the deeper the color gets. Green and white tea 
the least fermented varieties, contain the most antioxidants. Their health benefits are popular in the West. Red tea is fully fermented, mild but full-bodied in flavor. Oolong, a semi-fermented specialty tea, possesses characteristics of both green and red tea. Dark teas, such as Pu'er, are meticulously aged for years by a skilled tea master. As a result, they are incredibly valuable. Hangzhou Urban District, a popular tourist area known for its scenic West Lake. The most prized brand of green tea is grown nearby. It is a costly, premium tea known as Longjing or Dragon Well Tea. The spring harvest for Dragon Well Tea requires a sizable crew, scaling the mountainside for tender shoots. Workers may start picking at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning and only stop working at 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening. It's a very difficult job. We have to wither two and a half kilograms of green leaves to get one half kilogram of dried tea leaves. And a worker can only pick one quarter kilogram of green leaves each day. In a land where tea is supreme, more than 80 million people make a living in the industry. Another one of those people is Rong Hua Lai, fourth generation farmer and shop owner. I think it was tea that chose me. Tea has been very important to us since before I was born. The first thing we do after getting up in the morning is open our tea shop. Once a week or so, my wife will go into the yard and have a walkthrough. It takes five years for a seedling to mature for harvesting. This batch of tea leaves can be picked from March 18th to March 20th. The picking process has strict requirements. Like this tiny tea leaf, it can only be pulled out. The leaves will turn reddish if you rip them with your fingernails. The length of picked tea leaves is also relatively long, about two centimeters. The picking length can't be too long or too short. If they are picked too short, some of the leaf is wasted, but leaves that are too long are considered ugly. These green tea leaves are processed next molded by skilled hands into the much coveted Dragon Well number 43. Right now, the pot is being heated to a relatively high temperature, between 100 and 200 degrees centigrade. Pushing and pulling plays an important role here. When a high temperature is reached, the color of the tea leaves will gradually turn a yellow-green, which is a particular characteristic of Westlake Dragon Well tea. The first thing we do when someone comes to visit is make tea. We use it to welcome our friends. It bonds those who drink it together and makes it easier for them to get to know each other. <laughs> a soft contrast to mass-produced green tea is oolong, a quiet, delicate giant among tea varieties. Green tea still makes up 70% of tea production in China. What follows is red tea and then dark tea. Oolong tea presents itself as a premium tea as it's not produced in large amounts, but it has come to cater to high-end consumers who are attracted to its floral aromatic fragrances. Four variations of oolong come from provinces in southeastern China. Phoenix single trunk tea is the most artisanal. Phoenix tea is the best product among oolong tea and also the most treasured beverage. Phoenix single trunk tea is the perfume of all tea with a name that means beautiful scent. It is produced in Chaozhou City of Guangdong province. The climate is mild and the environment is very suitable for the growth of trees. Here we do not trim them so they can grow as tall as possible. The single trunk tea production process is relatively delicate among all teas and is more detail oriented. The first step is leaf picking. Tea leaf picking must occur between 1.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. It makes for the best fragrance. The second step is leaf drying. 
Third comes leaf sitting, which is divided into thrashing and tumbling. This is to even out the moisture and then to damage the leaf. Once it's damaged, the leaf ferments and replenishes moisture, breaking down internal substances. Now this has to be done five times. When tea leaves change color, some of them go from green to red. Oolong comes from those red-edged greens. And Chinese tea is not just for drinking. Beyond the cup, a rich assortment of tea-inspired products are available for daily use. We use the extracts from tea to develop products such as tea candy, tea noodle, tea snacks, and tea ice cream. There are also products for daily use, such as deodorant, cosmetics, and oral protection products. There are also socks and underwear treated with tea extracts to prevent odor. Tea is an agricultural mainstay in China's economy and a livelihood for many people. But its importance stretches far beyond mere commerce. Growing this humble leaf lays the groundwork for a cherished elixir that infuses all of Chinese culture. It's been 5,000 years since the Chinese people discovered and started drinking tea. We have shared this love of tea with much of the world and for good reason. Tea is said to be a perfect food, nutritional and tasty. It can also contribute to a sense of personal contentment. Few foods other than tea meet all of these criteria. That is why the Chinese people drink and love tea. To Chinese people, the value of tea surpasses the sum of its parts, purest water, custom utensils, quality leaves. China discovered and made tea. Then, over time, something profound happened. Tea made China. Nature chose China for tea. And you could also say tea formed Chinese culture. It aligns with our philosophy, spirit, and style of living. Human beings are full of scars, no matter what their nationality or history. The culture of tea eases the pain of the soul. In China, whether you're rich or poor, tea is an indispensable part of each of the day's three meals. Emperor and peasant, man and woman, young and old, all Chinese drink tea. We recommend having six to eight grams of tea a day, the same consumption as England or Japan. This is around two or three cups, but we'll brew the same batch three times for each cup of tea. More abiding than each cup's impression on the tongue is its footprint on civilization. Tea is a time-honored fixture in Chinese social settings, the great unifier bringing people together. Besides quenching thirst, drinking tea is fundamental to the way Chinese socialize. Above all is the communication it facilitates. No matter whether it's a business discussion or an intimate conversation between close friends, we do it over a cup of tea. It happens in a personal space and a public space. In the personal space, tea is a powerful accessory to matters of the heart. Tea can be used initially to endorse budding relationships and later to finalize the marriage ritual. Tea and marriage go very much together in Chinese culture. Since tea trees blossom often and yield many seeds, we associate them with human fertility. And since the life of a tree can last hundreds or even thousands of years, the association between tea and marriage is meant to impart longevity and vitality to the couple. When a girl and boy have been dating and reach the point of considering marriage, they will bring each other to visit their respective parents. The parents will serve tea to their potential daughter-in-law or son-in-law. If the parents recognize their daughter or son's partner, they will add sugar into the tea. 
The tea is sweet, suggesting the approval of the match. My husband is Pan Chang, a very handsome gentleman here in our wedding photo. On my wedding day, you can see that I was dressed in red, a color that in China suggests happiness and jubilation. According to traditional Chinese marriage custom, on the wedding day, the bride serves the groom's parents two cups of tea to express, I am joining this family. In the public space, tea houses, the Chinese equivalent of Western coffee shops, promote relationships among friends, sweethearts, and business associates. There are about 90,000 tea houses in China now. Different tea houses have their own specialties. They have as widely divergent personalities as people do. One of Hangzhou City's most beloved tea houses is located in the bottom floor of a popular hotel. Here, the clientele convene primarily for business. This tea house was opened back in 1996. At the time, we thought about many names and finally chose Ivy Tea House because it conjures up the pleasant idea of sitting in a garden to sip one's tea. Our upper floors are hotel rooms. Since most of the hotel guests are business people, many like to have a booth in our tea house to meet their guests. It's like an office and a living room together. Each country in the world has its own traditions around which people connect and form bonds. Drinking tea is that tradition in China, and drinking it occurs at all times of the day. Most Chinese just keep adding hot water to the pot. During the process of brewing and serving, we talk to each other and we get closer. Sipping seems to unlock the meditative magic of tea. Those interested in being entertained can bear witness to a tea ceremony, a lovely bit of theater performed to demonstrate the virtues of well-made tea. The ceremony is less about performance than the process of making tea. From start to finish, it completes an arc. First, we put out the tea set and warm the cups. When we pour in the tea, a pleasing aroma wafts up. With more hot water, the different scents may result. And with enough water, it's finally ready for drinking. Every step is, is quite lovely in itself, but we like our customers to experience the beauty of the entire process. All of China's 56 ethnic groups have a tea ceremony. This is a very important ritual and expresses multiple aspects of tea going far beyond its capacity to quench thirst. It shows how to brew tea correctly, how to perform the phoenix nodding head three times, how to use the left hand as a token of politeness and the right hand as a token of respect, how to pour tea and how to serve tea. For Dragonwell and other green teas, the Phoenix method is recommended to oxygenate the water and improve the taste of the tea. The three nods symbolize making three bows to guests as a gesture of respect. He Tea House, located at the foot of a Hangzhou monastery, is a prime meditative space that houses eye-catching antiques. 12 hours a day, seven days a week, patrons come here to experience tea culture in action. The pace of our tea house is slow and deliberate. Customers often stay 90 minutes to two hours. Sometimes they take long walks between servings, though certainly drinking tea is the main purpose of their visit. Generally speaking, people come here to relax. Our tea house is an escape from the pressures of a big city. Here, they can take a deep breath, literally and figuratively. The culture of tea represents some of the most glorious aspects of the last 4,700 years of Chinese history. The more I've learned about it, the more I've wanted to share it with all the people who pass through my tea house. Tea permeates China's service industry beyond its countless watering holes. Even the country's most eminent high society restaurants make room for humble tea, like a distinguished dinner guest. Bai Courtyard is famous in Beijing as well as all over China. It was originally a palace. A member of the Bai family renovated the courtyard 20 years ago and developed it into a restaurant. Every detail of this courtyard shows the cultural heritage of the Qing dynasty. 
It also has some dishes from the palace, which offer some rare and exotic tastes. Tea is tightly connected with dining, not only in this restaurant, but also in every restaurant in the country. The dining experience is incomplete without tea, which is on the table from the beginning to the end of the meal. As a consultant to the Bai Courtyard Restaurant, Mr. Wong advises the young servers on the rules of tea brewing. These young women, dressed and trained in Qing Dynasty imperial style, are called Ge Ge, Daughters of the Emperor. I want to talk to you about the brewing of oolong tea. Oolong tea is also our kung fu tea. When we really talk about Chinese tea, to my mind, we're talking about kung fu tea. Kung fu tea refers to our oolong tea. Just like the name says, it takes time. Across China, different tea production regions have their own unique traditions. In Chaozhou, famous for oolong, tea is served in a unique round tea set with only three tiny cups for sharing. There's a common saying in Chaozhou, tea is for three, wine is for four, and playing is for two. Drinking tea, there are three people. The number three is important in Chinese philosophy. It's a window into the culture of the people who think of three in terms of heaven, earth, and man. Drinking tea is a happy event. It is important to bring down the psychological barriers between people. By far the most critical component in advancing Chinese tea culture is education. The Tea Culture College of Zhejiang Agriculture and Forestry University leads the charge in educating China's young tea scholars. Students can study the science of tea, the art of tea, or the business of tea. There is a high quality we all insist upon. So first, we see if the tea meets the standard. Then we smell the tea to see how it holds up within its particular variety. And finally, we taste it. So see, smell, and taste. In the classroom across the hall, students practice the subtleties of serving the six varieties of Chinese tea. At the other end of the spectrum of tea knowledge are China's tea masters, who know tea in all its glory. For Chaozhou's Gong Fu tea expert, Han Zhongye, Oolong tea has a special aesthetic that by the right hands can be modeled into art. Ye's craft is called Cha Bai Xi, water painting on tea. Friendship, food, and learning, tea culture is there. Closing gaps, forging bonds. The deep and complex social customs bound up with this drink are meant to be shared and enjoyed, just like a warm cup of tea. Now we are back to um, the live Q and A. We will continue the videos after a sh you know a few discussions about what we watch and you know the questions that come up in the chat. Um, and if you have further questions, please put them in here, and we will try to answer it. Okay. I um, I write down a few notes here, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just read out Jordan's comment here. Um, 
about the tea terminology, how it's getting muddled in English. Um, it's very hard to explain HR to people when they're when there aren't really standard words to explain the aging and the darkening process. Yes. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I agree that, you know, when, um, you know, uh, things got translated, you know, a lot of context and, you know, meaning uh, got lost. So uh, the reason why I prefer dark tea, um, you know, the name dark tea as a tea type is because, Originally, the classification of tea is um, we use color. So if you notice, like, you know, in Chinese, it's green, yellow, blue, which is oolong, uh, black, which is red tea, and then dark and white. So, you know, six colors. And that's why, you know, calling it dark tea seems to be fit this theme a little bit more because it's still relative to color and if you just say hey cha you know not a lot of people know that hey means black and then if they know hey means black then they would think that hey cha is a black tea anyway um yeah so uh post fermented tea yes um because uh we are you know these six types of tea um even though they're called by the color of the liquid uh, they are actually classified according to the fermentation or oxidization level. So um, uh, to my surprise, green tea is the least oxidized, not white tea. White tea is actually a lot more oxidized, you know, because uh, it's sun wither. So it's sitting under the sun oxid uh, oxidizing. And um, so green tea is the least oxidized, where uh, black tea is the most oxidized. And that hence, the you know, the red color and then um dark tea is something else because um that is like you know fermentation where you spray water and then turn up the temperature and then bacterial and all that so it's like something else um you know uh it's not even in the chart <laughs> uh and yeah so if you find you know that it's easier to put things neatly in the box you know that that do it for me. Um, tea socks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think tea socks. Um, I don't know what it's called here in Australia, but we have a we have a thing like some people have what we call the Hong Kong feet, <laughs> which which is bacteria related and then you know green tea have a really good uh you know they kill bacteria really well so i'm imagining that they put the green tea substance in the tea so you know one is it will keep it smell smelling good and two is like it will keep bacteria but i've never seen one uh <laughs> if people are interested let me see i can both buy some <laughs> For all of our brewing listeners, <laughs> we can we can pray. if we got ten people interested, I will both buy some green tea socks here for you guys. How about that? <laughs> so you, yeah. I had someone show me um, a tea face mask. Actually. Ah, oh, that would be a much better idea than tea socks. Yeah, so, you know, I think, it, you know, the antibacterial properties mixed with the nice smell, fresh smell would probably not be so bad, actually. <laughs> ah, great idea. I will do a, do some research about that, too. I think that could be like a spin off things for the brewing. So, yeah, if you're interested in tea socks, tea mask, leave a comment and we will try to <laughs> get some in Australia. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yeah. Do you want to have a little chat about the the lid that covers the mouth while you drink technique? Um, Tricky to master. Yeah, I I don't do it. <laughs> uh, I'm not known for being discreet, unfortunately. I was even told that I'm not even that Chinese, so <laughs> I'm just like fake Chinese. So I can't give you any tips on that. Sorry. <laughs> and Tibalt said, I wonder which dishes they are serving and preparing from the Qing Dynasty. 
You mean to eat with tea? I think I think so. That was just after the restaurant. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not so sure, but like um, when I saw, you know, them dressing up, you know, in like palace costume. Uh, I just think that, you know, so originally the royal family for the Qing dynasty, they came from beyond the Great War. So, uh, you know, their diet and their habit for tea, like I don't even think they drink that much tea, you know, before entering, um, you know, the Great War. So I think that the tea culture is not originally part of the royal Qing dynasty um, thing. Uh, and that's why I'm scratching my head and, you know, thinking, what is this? Like, <laughs> why are they serving tea and dressing up like that? Uh, but yeah, the tea is extremely popular, still amount, you know, the Han, you know, Han culture and also, you know, influence the Qing uh, royal family because, you know, they get the best tea um, sent to them by default. And they mostly drinking it in, in the Gaiwan. So um, according to all the TV show I watch, <laughs> so that's not very conclusive. But like <laughs> all the TV show about Qing Dynasty period, uh, everyone drink tea in the Gaiwan. So that's all I know. But I can do more research about it if people want to know. Yeah. Oh, good. And Tanya has mentioned, said, I want to hear about Amanda's wedding. <laughs> I want to hear about your wedding too. What sort of tea did you know did, did they serve in the wedding? Okay, so this was long before I was interested in tea. <laughs> oh um yeah, so I'm married to a Chinese Malaysian, so they have the Chinese culture for the wedding. And we did the whole um where Nelson, my husband, had to come and get me from where I was staying and fight off all my relatives. They gave him all these challenges. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, they the made... most exciting part of the wedding day for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't do it quite traditional. My family kind of ran with, oh, yeah, let's challenge him. So they made him sing the Australian National Anthem and swim a length of the pool with the flower in his mouth and then have a shot of whiskey and do all of these crazy things at eight o'clock in the morning but he got wow. me wow that's so cool do you have footage of that i would like to see yeah, it. there are videos out there somewhere yeah. and then yeah. um of course we did the tea ceremony which i don't think i even poured the tea i was just given a cup to then serve um nelson's family starting with the oldest and um, and then I did all that, but I will show you. I've got it here. I, I'm my beautiful wedding tea set that I was wow. given. <laughs> Never been used. Yes, but it's there. <laughs> oh, that is so sweet. So sweet. Yes. And my very special. I've got two of these little wedding gaiwans. <laughs> yes. You know what? Happiness or double love or something? <laughs> no, it means you know together for a hundred years. <laughs> Are you prepared for that? <laughs> oh well, we've done what ten or something, so yay! Ten down. <laughs> ten percent down. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, for me, it was a unique experience, and um, you know, I, yeah, I enjoyed it very much. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, I went to my cousin's um, wedding. Uh, I didn't have a Chinese wedding. Uh, so I went to her wedding, it's quite traditional, but they didn't actually serve communion sinensis. They serve this tea with red dates and, you know, um, rock sugar. Like, you know, it's all about the meaning. Like, you know, it has to be something sweet and then, you know, the color needs to be a little bit red and it has... I think maybe some sort of peanuts in it. I don't remember because I it means you know they will have children or something like that. So I I'm just curious like what sort of tea they use for your wedding. Oh, uh, I <laughs> I could ask. 
and see if I can find out, but no, I can't you remember. Didn't serve it. No, you only serve it now, okay. I think I only yeah. served it. Definitely had a colour to it, but I thought it was definitely Camellia sinensis, but I I couldn't even be sure. It was, <laughs> it was 10 years ago. <laughs> I see. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was, you know, that is that sounds so lovely. Sounds yeah, like an amazing it was a day. Experience. So next time I'll pull out the photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to see. Maybe we oh, can all oh, photoshopped. <laughs> no, we can live stream your wedding. <laughs> Oh no. You know, we bore people too much. <laughs> well, okay. Now, um, other than that, I also want to touch on I think Kristen mentioned that she did she was not aware that a tea picking has to happen at a certain time of the day. And it does because uh, tea making, you know, takes such a long time and it has to be done in the morning like you know first thing in the morning <clears throat> because like after you pick it you need to catch the morning sun to with it and then you know after it's with it you pull it in and if you're making oolong then you know you will be doing the tea tossing in the afternoon and then you know if you're doing poor then the pan fryings happen you know somewhere around the evening so it's very very label intensive i uh, basically during tea picking seasons you wake up to pick tea and then you'll be just finishing off before you go to bed and then you do it again the next day so yeah uh, it has to be in the morning and i also read i think also in lu yu's um tea bible is it okay to call it tea bible i don't know how else to call it do you know if there's another translation for that book as in or, the classic of tea yeah the classic of tea is a better translation yeah in who you describe in the classic of tea that um it has to be picked on a sunny day so if it's cloudy apparently the tea won't be ideal but i think that we pick every day you know during the tea production uh so if it's rainy no tea picking because you know then the tea will be quite wet and moist and it's not very good for the production afterward uh yeah so early in the morning preferably on a sunny day okay yep and uh i think that just before we stopped the video uh he was uh the tea master was doing a um some sort tea. of yeah. he whisked a bowl of tea and then it's very fluffy at the top yeah. And then he's drawing on the froth. And, you know, when I first learned about that, I'm like, oh, so they have latte art. <laughs> Song <laughs> Dynasty. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just think it's amazing, like, you know, if you dive deep into it, like the things that people do 2,000 years ago, essentially is not that different to what we're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. So um, if you have any more questions about the things that we discussed, now is the time to ask it. And because uh, we are very close to our one hour mark of streaming. Um, if there's no more questions, then we will stream the rest of the tea documentary. You can um, finish watching the documentary and if you have any further questions you can come on on facebook and we will try to answer it in our next live stream but we won't be jumping back into the chat room to talk to you uh, after the end of the video so i'm gonna wait maybe 30 seconds for more questions and then we will play the rest of the documentary how does it sound amanda it sounds very good. I will just mention on Thursday at 8 o'clock, we have Kaishan from A Leaf Story joining yes, us. Yes, me again. <laughs> live session, her real live session. Um, yes. <laughs> display three of her teas. Um, so that's really going to be a great session. So please come along. And, um, yes, like I said, in our Facebook marketplace, if you want to brew along with us, please go and buy some tea and then you can brew along um as Kaishan's brewing them live with you and she'll give you some tips and tricks yeah thank you for mentioning that <laughs> so yes uh, I'm going live again next Thursday I'll be talking about small pot tea 
which you know in my head it means Gong Fu Cha, but in a modern sense. Um, <clears throat> and I'll share with you a little bit about brewing techniques and you know the history of um, tea of art a little bit because uh, it's a very long topic, but I won't go too deep into it. And uh, and then Saturday we have Tanya. Tanya is actually in the chat room today. Hi, Tanya. And uh, we will also be talking about uh, Art of Tea in Taiwan with Tanya, how to approach Taiwanese tea. She's really good with, um, you know, knowledge around that. So, you know, follow us, subscribe us, share our posts so more people can watch because our goal here is to grow the Australian tea community for QLIP tea. And we really would need your help and we would not be able to do it by ourselves. And then back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say thank you for joining us. We really appreciate everybody um, coming along to these little events and, you know, sharing a little bit of time with us. It's lovely. It's really nice. Yes. Thank you. All right. Should I put the movie back on? The, our doco back on? <laughs> yeah, sure. And we'll be just saying goodbye here. And then, you know, please stay behind and watch the rest of the documentary and hope you're enjoying it. Yeah, and we'll keep putting your comments up as we go as well, so you're not alone. <laughs> Coming. Tea has often been seen as being as good for a person as friendship, flowers, or being surrounded by physical beauty. So I advise all my friends to drink more tea. Thursday morning in China. You're not feeling quite yourself. Like any ailing person, you seek the counsel of a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine is one of the treasures in Chinese culture. TCM has evolved for more than 2,000 years. It particularly emphasizes the idea of nature-man dependency. As human beings, we live in nature and are influenced by nature. TCM not only has its own theories, but also practically cures a lot of complex diseases, playing a role in the long history and prosperity of the Chinese nation. Fundamental to Chinese medical practice is the concept of qi. Taken literally, qi translates to breath, or air, but figuratively, it has come to represent the vital material energy that courses through the body. Qi is particularly emphasized in Chinese culture, and this idea is also used in TCM theories. There's a theory called measuring substances with phenomena in TCM, which means that the activities of Qi in our body are inferred from external symptoms by looking, listening, questioning, and feeling the pulse. TCM recognizes five different kinds of bodily constitutions when diagnosing and treating patients. Neutral, yin and cold, yang and hot, phlegm and damp, and dry. Teas of different natures are prescribed to boost energy and organ functioning for all five. Since ancient times, there's been a saying, 
Tea is the medicine for 10,000 diseases. This saying became popular in the Tang Dynasty, and if it didn't hold any truth, the saying wouldn't still be popular. However, modern medicine has been able to prove its validity. So the saying is true. Tea has been proven effective against free radicals, which means it does, in fact, cure disease. To the Chinese, tea is, first, a prevailing remedy for life's little maladies, offering a steamy, soothing solution to nearly anything that galls the body. Tea as medicine was recorded in the Compendium of Materia Medica. It is a crucial element of traditional Chinese medicine. A cup of hot tea keeps away external evils when having a cold or flu. In case of mental illnesses, such as depression or feeling uncomfortable, we would have tea to release our emotions. The first function of tea is detoxification. The second is promotion of blood circulation. And the third is losing weight. Tea can help with weight loss, allowing those who drink it to avoid the health issues of obesity. Tea also aids with sobriety, not just in the sense of a daily alertness and calm, but as a counterpoint to alcohol consumption. Drinking too much wine never helped a person make smarter choices, rather the opposite. Natural herb teas for general health and wellness are just the beginning of the purifying powers attributed to tea. Just as tea can aid and alleviate, so too can it treat. Obviously, drinking tea only is not enough for medical treatment because the concentration of the active ingredients in the tea is low. For example, if we drink a cup of tea like this every day, the concentration of active ingredients is considerably diluted by water. This works over time for the maintenance of general health, but for specific medical treatment, we need to extract those ingredients and concentrate them in pill form. What ingredients make tea such an effective weapon on the front line of traditional Chinese medicine? A trifecta of powerful chemicals ingrained in every leaf. Polyphenols, caffeine, and theanine. There are more than 500 different chemicals in a tiny tea leaf. Those chemicals fall into three principal categories, each of which collectively constitutes what are known as tea's characteristic ingredients. Polyphenols are undoubtedly the most important chemicals in tea, where they are found at quite a high concentration. As we know, a key factor in the causation of human disease is excessive free radicals. Free radical reactions can weaken and break down our cells, which in turn can cause disease. The search for chemicals to fight the effects of free radicals has been global. The polyphenols in tea have made it an effective and natural agent to counter the toxic effects of free radicals. The second major chemical is caffeine, which makes us alert. And the third, theanine, is a kind of amino acid, which it turns out can only be found in a very few species. Theanine determines the freshness of the tea, but also provides its calming effect. These three chemicals together imbue tea with its healthy, refreshing aspects. Polyphenols carry the most clout. When combined with other modes of treatment, researchers find them capable of mounting a strong offensive against even the most aggressive diseases. Research has shown that the polyphenols in tea are excellent cancer fighters. For patients undergoing chemotherapy and radiation, combining the extracts from tea with standard therapies has made for very effective cancer treatments overall. This is in widespread use at present. But what of Xu Fei, our patient diagnosed with stomach deficiency? At the behest of his TCM doctor, he will fill his prescription for tea and other herbal medicines at the local herb pharmacy, stocked floor to ceiling with nature's bounty. Medicine from Huqing Yutang is very popular. Huqing Yutang has a history of several hundred years, and that's why most doctors in Hangzhou want to practice here, hoping to gain value. No doctor can succeed without quality medicine. Therefore, good doctors, coupled with fine medicine, make Hu Qing Yu Tang famous. Hanging high on the wall inside Hu Qing Yu Tang, a sign displaying the pharmacy's business credo makes public an important ethic. It reads, refrain from dishonesty in business practices, 
Medicines are important to people's lives. Tea's benefits can be divided into two categories. One is maintaining overall health, the other is medical treatment. The health benefit is seen over the long term, while the medical treatments found as extracts in pill form have immediate effect. Drinking tea clears away anxiety and raises your spirits. Therefore, a cup of tea, especially in the morning, leads to good spirits throughout the whole day. So you see, most of the old traditional Chinese physicians like me have black hair and a youthful face. Given its combined benefits, it is no mystery why tea's good name reaches far beyond its motherland. Chinese tea first infiltrated Western culture centuries ago through foreign trade. Today, in the United States, tea sales continue to climb. According to the U.S. Tea Association, in 1993, there's $2 billion in the U.S. tea market, well, in 2013, there's 10 billion already. So that's five times more within the past 20 years. The tea industry has really exploded in the United States. You can actually see it in any grocery store. Grocery stores, a tea shelf used to be a really small amount of tea, uh, mostly um, tea bags. But now in some of the grocery stores, they have whole aisles of tea, loose leaf tea, high-end tea, all different types of tea from all over the world including teas grown on U.S. soil. America can't compete with the world's most prolific tea production regions, but there are a few farms across the country, from Alabama to Michigan to Oregon, even Hawaii. Best known is the Charleston Tea Plantation, a fully mechanized outfit that grows and processes the leaves sold as American classic tea. There is a tea plantation that's open to the public. So I went there. And the difference that I would say between that plantation and some of the other farms, tea farms I went to in China would be the height. The Charleston plantation was only flat, basically. They only processed the green and black tea. Rare as they are against the American landscape, these farms reflect their owner's appreciation for the ancient Chinese tea tradition. And for those who can't grow their own, there are other ways to connect with tea. In the American environment, sometimes we meet friends who came back from China. They bring the gifts as different kinds of tea. We go to some local shops, and of course, there are online community. One a really good one is called steepers.com. Many people actually use it as their Facebook and to rank all different kinds of tea. Smaller local tea houses and shops have also sprouted up putting their own twist on an ancient Chinese tradition. In the American South, they are regarded as social treasures, portals to a faraway culture. It's all the different varieties that they have and the processes that's been handed down for thousands of years that just make it so wonderful and special. It's not just a drink, it's a culture. It's a way of life. By making a really good cup of tea, it's showing your respect to where it comes from. It's just like making a fine wine for that year. It's the terrain and the soil and the season. Was it too dry? Was it not? And the winning oolong for that season could be worth $20,000 a pound. 
because of that. It's just the process of making it that makes it so special. You're, you're, you're making it, you put water on it, you really inhale it and smell the aromas, then you taste it, you swallow and enjoy just the liquor of the tea. It's connecting yourself with the environment, the tea leaves that have memory of all those uh, geography, the rainfalls, uh, the sunshine that before it was plugged, it all absorbed into itself. When people are consuming tea, they're always kind of afraid on how do I make it? How do I steep it? There is really not a lot of wrong ways of making it. You just have to make sure that you put the correct temperature on the particular tea. Like black tea needs boiling water, but white, green and oolong tea needs to be right under boiling. Like any culture that inherits an age-old tradition, America has certainly made its share of revisions. Hot tea here is a distant second to the near unanimous preference for iced tea. Of all teas consumed in the United States, 85% are iced. Tea has really become a part of people's lifestyle, especially in the South. People drink a lot of iced tea in the South, make it very uh, sweet, which they don't do in China. The temperature is, is totally uh, not really in our own tradition of drinking it. People will refer to sweet tea, and that's basically a black tea, like a Ceylon uh, tea that is brewed and sugars add to it. I always educate people about all the additions to tea that they're not necessarily uh, enhance the tea experience. Chinese people prefer more pure taste of the tea itself, while here in the States people prefer more uh, fruity flavor. I would say not to put any additions in tea and really experience first the, the aroma and the specialty of the tea. Many of the American tea shops or tea houses are making their new inventions. We can start by looking at the menu. Some of them would rank the different teas according to the caffeine level, which is something very seldom you can see in China. Usually we categorize in China by the color of tea. Tea service in American tea shops is commonly presented in this very fashion. Loose leaf varieties organized by caffeine content and a creative menu of special tea drinks. That's where we would take the tea and make special types of concoctions and drinks out of it, either hot or cold. Hot tea lattes, iced tea lattes, spritzers, and that type of thing. Giving people more variety, more creativity in use of our teas. We have over 160 teas from around the world. The menu is set up so that it is uh, caffeine, starting over here with the most caffeine. It's color-coded with black teas, oolong greens, and then the whites, which are very low in caffeine, or abyssin herbals that are caffeine-free. We have tea tastings at our tea bar. Uh, it's kind of like a fine wine tasting, if you would imagine, and we talk about where the tea comes from, how to brew the tea, the benefits of the tea. Uh, anything that you want to know about that type of tea. The lessons offered at this bar introduce customers to the delicate practice of tea brewing. For the best results by tea type, instructions specify the quantity of leaves, water temperature, and steep time necessary to make one perfectly balanced eight ounce cup of Chinese tea. Tea is an experience. You have tea, you take time out to either have tea for yourself or have tea with a person. So it's more of an experience versus a beverage. All teas from the tea plant have L-theanine. Gives you a natural, a calming effect. You know, nothing breaks my heart more than someone to come in and, and order a really nice oolong and want to put it in a cocoa. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you should sit and have that. But you know, I do it too. You know, I, I got to have my cup to go. We're just fast paced and revved up with coffee, you know? With coffee, you're getting that caffeine rush, then you crash. But with tea, it's released a little more staged. We find that a lot of coffee drinkers that have never been tea drinkers transition very well by drinking pu'er. It is actually fermented, and the longer that it's fermented and aged, really the better it gets, like fine wine. Despite the common ground tea finds as east meets west, 
there are layers of custom and meaning inherent to Chinese tea practice that do not translate to American consumers. Tea experts or tea lovers in China, they prefer the loose leaf tea. While over here, I think it's more for convenience or efficiency. People want the tea bags. We believe the loose leaf tea are of better quality because in the tea bags, although it's convenient and fast, those are grinded into powder or smaller pieces that people can no longer tell the quality of them. In terms of more symbolic values, in 1972, when Nixon, the president, was visiting China, he brought a gift from the States saying it's very unique because that's some soil from the moon. Well, the return gift from our president at that time was the tea from Huang San, uh, saying that it's the symbol of the hearts of people over there. To Chinese people, tea is hospitality. So whenever you go to an uh, even stranger's house, they would treat you uh, hot tea. It's part of people's lives, not only in the current time, but also in the river of the history. So the memories we associate it with it are different as well. In viewing tea as a simple social beverage, Western tea lovers risk closing the door on the spiritual dimension of this ageless elixir, refusing tea's invitation to reflect, to soothe, to heal, and to inspire. It requires a mindset that transcends our common affinity for tea, recognizing instead the divine serenity found in tea. Sometimes if we're going too fast, we lose track of things and we don't really connect with ourselves. When we are really practicing making a good cup of tea, it takes a lot of patience and awareness. First of all, we do need to know where it comes from to really appreciate its whole essence. We smell it and we wait for the water to be the right temperature and then seeing the dancing of tea leaves and unfolding of it. And we wait until the perfect timing to really appreciate um, and savor the beauty in it. We can definitely uh, use some help from the Chinese character of tea itself. It is made of three parts. So on the top, it symbolizes the grass. In the middle is human. And at the bottom is the wood. So tea means human is back to nature among the grass and woods. All people in this world they can benefit by being more uh, mindful about our environment, about the nature itself, and about the nature in ourselves.